From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, forecasts are suggesting people will see their disposable income fall by 7% over the next two years. The Office for Budget Responsibility has released its report off the back of the Chancellor's autumn statement. As a result of that, millions of people will be paying more taxes, with the Treasury's own figures revealing more than half of households will be worse off. But Jeremy Hunt insists the government is taking the right approach to the economic pressure. Yes, we take difficult decisions to tackle inflation and keep mortgage rates down. But our plan also leads to a shallower downturn, lower energy bills, higher growth and a stronger NHS and education system. Income tax thresholds will be frozen while more workers will pay the highest rate of tax. The windfall tax on energy companies will be increased to 35% and there'll be less support for household bills, although more money is being set aside for schools, the NHS and social care. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, will be joining Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC tomorrow morning. And also this evening, the Royal College of Nursing is giving the government five days to begin what it's calling detailed negotiations on pay, or it will announce strike dates for December. It's calling for a pay rise of 5% above inflation, even though the government says that that is unaffordable. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down four points at 73.46. The pound buys $1.18 and €1.14. LBC weather, wet and windy for much of the country tonight, but drier with just a few showers in the far south, with a low of 5 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's Autumn Statement Day, so we thought we'd put on an extra edition of Cross Question with four economic experts. They're here to answer all of your questions on the Autumn Statement on economic policy, so don't be shy in dialing 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850, or you can, of course, uh, you can, of course, ask a question on Alexa. Just say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. With me in the studio for the next hour, we have, have Professor Ian McCafferty, former member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee and our Senior Advisor for Financial Advisory Company London Wall Partners. Good to have you back, Ian. Uh, Yale Selfin, to my right, as Chief Economist for the accountancy company KPMG. Good to see you. And Dr Linda Yu is veteran of Cross Question. Well, I think you've been on twice before. Um, economist based at the University of Oxford and the author of the book The Great Economists. Alfie Sterling, to my right, is Director of Research and Chief Economist for the New Economics Foundation. I'm really looking forward to this, hour because I think there was so much in this autumn statement, far more than you would normally expect to get for obvious reasons, and I think it all needs a little bit of explaining. That's what we're here to do over the course of the next hour. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And just to repeat, all the questions this hour are going to be on the autumn statement or economic policy. Normally, I wouldn't try and prescribe any subject off limits, but all other subjects are off limits tonight. Uh, our panel's just heaved a great sigh of relief. Uh, John is in Hornchurch. He's our first caller. Hello, John. How are you doing, Ian, and the panel? Very well, thank uh, you. What would you like to ask? Um, Jeremy Hunt said that this budget will bring higher growth. My question is, where is the growth? You mean, where is it coming from? Where is it? Yeah, where is it coming from? Where did you highlight it? I didn't, from my point of view, okay. I didn't see any aspect of growth in this budget. Alfie Sterling, let's come to you first, because, of course, Liz Trust was all about growth, growth, growth. Um, did you see much evidence in this sort of statement that uh, Jeremy Hunt realises that there has to be economic growth? No, I didn't. Not in the uh, short term and not in the medium term. Um, you know, the big picture here is, of course, living standards are being squeezed, 7% according to the OBR, um, over the next two years. That's the biggest squeeze in living standards in real terms on record. Um, and how that breaks down distributionally is um, the poorest 10% of households essentially seeing the cost of essentials uh, rising by about £2,000 more than the rising of uh, rising income. 
whether that's earnings or, or welfare payments. Um, and that is a big suck on growth. That's sucking money and spending power um, out of the economy. Over that period, that period of the deeper squeeze, government is effectively has a negligible fiscal stance going into those two years. And what I mean by that is not really any net increase in tax or spending. It's r- roughly about, about even over those two years. Um, so certainly not supporting uh, growth. In the second half of the forecast, um, you then see all the tightening in terms of trying to manage the public finances. So certainly no growth in there. But most importantly, what actually, you know, what does growth mean? What does it mean for people who've got squeezing living standards? Linda? Um, I would probably say that um, he has ring fence about 600 um, billion in terms of um, uh, infrastructure investment. Um, and uh, there's another provision around relaxing the rules of uh, solvency too, which is this EU um, regulation around how pension funds could invest, for instance, for the long term. So I think the the way we raise growth is to raise people's incomes, and you do that by raising output, by raising productivity. So in other words, you need to invest in order to generate. So they're, for instance, safeguarding the rollout of full fi- of fiber broadband, high-speed broadband. That would enable people to work from home. That could enable more e-commerce. So investment takes years for growth to, to come about. But I think uh, that shows that um, in terms of where they hope the growth comes from. I think they are focusing on investment. They've also safeguarded the spending around R&D. But because you don't see it in the growth forecast, um, that is because um, you don't get this payoff from growth until years down the line. And he doesn't have a huge amount of wriggle room. Because remember, Jeremy Hunt, he foreshadowed a lot of this um, previously. Mm. He said, there'll be no rabbits out of the hat. This is a very tough budget. Um, But I think he's done what he can in terms of um, trying to get some investment in there because ultimately that's what's going to deliver i think he and he also said um he had the worst job in the world except for um the guy in the jungle yeah that was a bit of a a lame joke wasn't it (laughs) i think there's probably other people that could say they've got the worst jobs the people in the ukrainian army possibly um ian mccafferty growth um where is economic growth going to come from after this autumn statement well i think as Alfie said, there is very little by way of demand stimulus coming from this uh, this autumn statement, uh, other than the fact that everything has been backloaded. All of the major measures are really not taking place until 2024, 2025. And as a result... Coincidentally, after the next election. Coincidentally, of course, mm. after the next election. But what that does mean is that the government is not making the recession even worse than it might have been as a result of uh, clamping down on fiscal policy too early, as it were. But I agree agree with Linda. I mean, the, the main way in which we can stimulate growth in this economy, sustainable growth at least, is through changes in what economists would call the supply side, the skills of our workers, the degree of investment in, in infrastructure and in, in business and so on. And there were, as Linda has already mentioned, a few uh, measures mentioned in the autumn statement towards those. They will take a long time to feed through. Re-educating uh, workers yeah. for new skills is going to take decades. But certainly those are the way I think we need to look for growth rather than in terms of government stimulus through either taxes or spending. Okay, Yale. Well, I agree. I agree with Ian um, and with with everybody else. I'd just add that um, as part of that longer term growth, there's also um, a little bit more spending on education, and that is a skill agenda, potentially, and that should help the longer term growth. And I think really the focus here was to try and prevent, as Ian said, a much worse um, growth scenario in the short term and and pass things a little bit later on um, once the economy recovers a little bit. But ultimately, this is a longer term play. Linda mentioned the public sector um, involvement in terms of the investment, but there's obviously we mustn't forget the private sector. And for the private sector to invest, we need the certainty and stability that would entice them to come back and spend in the UK. And that's another thing that they're trying to do. Um, John, do you want to come back on what you've heard? Um, yes, um, Tony, and, and thanks for, for all your all your um, your panel. Um, but I, I understand, I take into consideration what Alistair said. And the, the issue is that, yes, there could be long-term growth but then you are banking on certain things happening. And the issue with that is that within the next year or next two years, 
people could lose their houses, people could lose their jobs. The, the actual, what the OBR forecast is that disposable income is going down by 7, 7% over the next two years. So people are going to struggle. So yes, there could be a forecast of long-term growth, but if it's not going to affect people now, it, it, it could be by the time we get to 10, 15, 20 years, we, we, we could be in a very, very different situation. Okay, John, thank you very much. Uh, Chris says, could we have the political standings of tonight's panel? Each panel member will be coming from their own views, as I'm sure everyone uh, with four economists, you would usually get four different answers for the same question. That's so suspicious that you've all given vaguely similar yeah. answers to that. I don't know if you... Uh, I mean, it, the, the politics of this is relevant, but I'm not sure it's relevant for our panel to declare sort of which political party they support, unless any of them wishes to. Too, but uh, I mean, Alfie, your, your organisation is, you would say, broadly sort of left leaning, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, we're an you know, independent research charity and we focus on reducing inequality and reducing carbon emissions. Mm. If that's a left agenda, then, but that, that's what we're <laughs> focusing on. OK, let's go to Shuvik in Eltham. Hello, Shuvik. Hello there, Ian. Um, y- yes, um, um, I'd, I'd like to ask the panel um, I've just come from the Excel Centre, it's a trade and investment um, fair in, um, in Greenwich. Um, uh, but uh, th- there are um, re- there were representatives at the center from France, from Germany, from uh, from Poland, um, from the U.S., from China, um, uh, uh, and many other countries as well. Um, uh, India, India was there also. Um, so, but so I mean, um, I'd like to ask um, how much does um, how much do we have to uh, how much do we need an export drive and increased trade? How much would that um, contribute to the growth um, to um, um, dealing with the, um, the the very slow rate of growth we're suffering from at, at the moment. So an export drive, I mean, we used to talk about the balance of payments all the time. That's never mentioned at all now uh, in McCafferty. Ha- there was nothing in the budget, as far as I could see, to, uh, to in that direction at all. Nothing at all, no. And I think it's one of those, um, it's the dog that hasn't barked or the, 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 the subject is or the elephant in the room, if you like. One of the main reasons why the UK economy has grown so poorly uh, in recent years, there's been ups and downs, obviously, with the pandemic and the recovery and so on, but generally we have not performed well, uh, certainly for the last decade or so. And one of the main reasons for that is that uh, trade has not stimulated growth uh, overall over that period. Certainly over the latter part of the last decade and and now, one can attribute part of that to some of the disruption from leaving the European community, Brexit. And uh, that has certainly depressed exports, at least in the short term. There are opportunities from Brexit, as as, uh, many in the government would tell you, uh, and we uh, are hoping that therefore trade will pick up in future years as people get used to the new regulatory climate but for the time being trade is one of our uh, weak links if you like in the UK economy and if we were to see it pick up it would be very helpful at this current period. And in terms of the value of the currency does that help exports or suck in imports? It helps. Well, it always used to be said... I do know the answer to that question, by the way, but I'm just asking. It always used to be said (laughs) that the depreciation of the currency by making exports cheaper would help sell them. The problem is that trade is now so integrated that most of our exports are made up from imported components that we've then assembled, which then meet... But, of course, a a, a weakening currency increases the price Mm. of the imports. So, as a result, most modern studies would tell you that there is very little benefit in terms of of stimulating trade from depreciating your currency. I take it back. I didn't know the answer to that question, uh, Linda. Uh, no, that is um, that is indeed the case. We actually have had a record uh, trade deficit over the past few months, and of course, sterling has dropped to um, really quite low levels against the dollar and um, the euro near parity <coughs> at one point. And so, even with the decline just against the dollar, fifteen percent. Um, trade, um, the deficit, trade deficit has actually grown over the course of this year. So that means that what we're selling isn't uh, being driven by the price of the currency um, or it isn't being helped by the price of the currency because what we sell it tends to be based more on quality and um, and we sell more services, obviously, than, than goods. So to answer the question, yes, if we could sell more exports, um, that would help. In order to sell more exports, we need to be more productive. 
um, because ultimately you cannot sell what abroad what you do not produce at home. And there's a number of reasons around this, but I think generally our productivity um, needs a boost. We underinvest. We're about um, yeah, 10% of GDP of investment, which is lower than the G7. Why is that? So this is a really good question. It probably is the key to our slow growth. So um, it's not because we're predominantly services, um, because the U.S. also invests more than we do, and they also have services as a share of the economy. So the question is, why is it? What are the? I think um, Yale referred to it. What are the? What are the impediments to companies investing? There's two things that always come out on top. One is um, uncertainty, so they need a clear regulatory framework, um, and the second one is skills. Um, they need to have an appropriately skilled workforce. So that goes to show why you need a longer term plan with a clear uh, tax and regulatory framework, why it is you need to invest in not just physical capital, but human capital, and why you need to put in digital infrastructure. Um, and then that would all help to try to raise the um, investment rate, and that would help growth. And the final word on um, the currency, one of the reasons we have higher inflation than the other G7 countries is because we uh, have more pass through of, uh, we import a great deal. So it means our imports are more expensive when sterling is cheap, and then therefore more the global inflation pressures passes through into our so own. Isn't prices. German inflation higher than ours? German inflation, I think the latest rate is about. It's, I think it's actually still lower than ours. Ours is eleven point one percent in the latest read. There is so. there, part of the peak inflation in this argument about inflation between Britain, Germany and others, and I think it is the case that the latest month German inflation is higher than ours, is partly due to the different treatment of how governments are helping uh, their populations in terms of energy subsidies or cap. We have capped energy costs and that's brought down our peak rate of inflation from an expected 15-16% down to a peak of 11 and has thus brought us slightly in below Germany simply because they are helping their population in different ways than capping the energy price. I'd love to have an explanation explanation for Dutch inflation, which is, I think the last time I saw it was 17%. Well, they have made no adjustment. They have made no interventions into the, the energy market. Oh, that's it. That is very interesting. Oh. Right. Um, I'm not going to put each question to all four panellists necessarily because I want to fit in as many as possible. Um, so we'll come to more of your questions in just a moment. It's 17 minutes past eight. The Autumn Statement. Have your say on LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. At uh, 20 past eight on LBC, just to clear up the German inflation rate, it's 10.4% in October compared to our 11.1%, but goes both heading in the same direction, I suppose. Uh, right, let's go to another question. We have Professor Ian McCavity, Yale Salfin, Dr Linda Yu and Alfie Sterling with us answering your questions on the autumn statement. Uh, John is in Lewisham and this is on a text. Is freezing tax thresholds and personal allowances a good idea? Is it honest? Yale. Well, I guess in some ways it is a little bit less clear than just raising tax rates because you can't actually see it straight away. So there'll be quite a lot of people that potentially don't notice it. Um, but at the same time, in some ways, it is slightly easier for for people to manage because it is smoother in the sense that they don't just all of a sudden have a rate increase they will only see that when they have a rise in their wages that puts them brings them up to to that new um, level of tax so in that sense it is a little bit easier on people but also it is a bit trickier on government because not only is it they need to forecast um, the current um, income uh, that can't take that they could have from taxes, but they also need to forecast wage increases. Um, so so in, in that sense, it is slightly harder to forecast. And they may actually find out that they receive less money mm. as a result of it, because we've actually seen wages behave relatively uh, modestly compared to the rise in inflation. Alfie, is it honest? Because, I mean, okay, the government announced it, so we all know what it's going to be, but it's different from saying, well, we're going to put up the uh, 40p rate to 42p or 45p. That 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 was what traditionally used to happen, wasn't it, in budgets? Yeah. That it would, it would, people didn't take so much notice of the, uh, the banding. It was always the headline rate. Well, I think, to be fair, traditionally, I think there's been a lot of fiscal drag in the past with, you know, Gordon Browns and George Osmond have done a lot of this um, stuff as well, so they sort of concealed tax rights. So I'd say it's fairly politically traditional to do this from all ends of the spectrum. Um, so as I'm thinking back to the 70s uh, and 80s, where you're thinking... Sure, OK, fine, right. Yeah, 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 fair, fair enough, fair enough. Although I think if you go if you can go back there, I think you find tax allowances are getting played around with quite a bit. But, um, but look, I mean, yeah, I think there is a point... Um, about the transparency, in terms of just the signal to, to you know to the public, to voters, a headline rate increase is more obvious um, than a frozen threshold. But you know, I think you can overstate this because in the end, everyone essentially, if they want to know what their tax take is, they'll have to put it into a tax calculator. You know, a one percentage point increase mm. in the basic rate of income tax doesn't mean your tax goes up by one percent. It's more complicated than that. It's, you know, it's a twentieth of income tax on that band, etc. So most people need to plug this stuff into a calculator anyway if they want to know what the effect is. This is no different. And I would say probably the bigger point is, is this tax rise fair? You know, is it distributionally progressive? And actually almost all personal income tax thresholds, almost all thresholds of national insurance other than the upper earnings limit, if you freeze them, um, they have a very progressive uh, tax take. So the richest families richest taxpayers will pay more of that tax increase than anyone else. And so as far as that's concerned, and we're asking about the, those are the broader shoulders making the greatest contribution, I think these are effective uh, policy measures. Kang and Fleet has texted to say, I didn't see any help for the squeezed middle. You could argue in this autumn statement it's actually middle earners who've been hit hardest, I suppose. Um, the UK economy is a service economy. By restricting our disposable income, they're taking away the positive multiplier effect, e.g. I won't eat out at restaurants, uh, that they won't have any business, and so, and so on. I can't bring myself to vote Conservative again, as the middle have been ignored for too long. I may as well try Labour in the next election. Well, we've Rachel Reeves is listening. She'll be very happy with you there, Keng. Uh, let's go to Jonathan in Lancaster Gate. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Ian, and thank you very much for taking my question. Um, my question is inflation is currently 11%, and the nurses are asking for 5% over inflation, and yet the governor of the, cent of the um, uh, um, Bank of England sees inflation below his 2% target in two years. Now, did the experts see anything in today's autumn statement that will bring inflation below target? He, he really said that? He thinks it'll be below 2% within two years? That is what I heard on television last night. Ian McCafferty. 
Um, as far as I understand it, the Bank of England forecasts are that inflation will return to target at some stage in the first half of 2024. That's never going to happen, is it? Well, to be honest, because inflation is a measure of difference, it's the rate of change over the course of the last year, you only need uh, prices to stop going up as fast as they have been going up until now for the inflation rate to start falling. And if we... Uh, then look ahead and we see that essentially you know, the, even though the cap on energy prices is slightly higher after April than it is from October, it's a relatively small increase compared with the very sharp increases that we've seen in gas prices through until now. That in itself will reduce inflation quite sharply. If you then add into that, and that happens, that will take place not only for gas, but also for a number of other uh, big commodity items uh, and food items that we've seen going up very sharply. Food's up 16% this year in, in within the inflation index. But we're already seeing on global commodity markets that many of the commodity prices, which will then feed through into these goods, are already back to pre-Ukraine -inva pre invasion levels. So we are starting to see some of the adjustment to that. And by the course of the latter part of 2023, those those uh, figures will be taking away from the inflation rate quite rapidly. If you then add into that the forecast from the, both the Bank of England and from the OBR today that we are going to go into a recession over the course of 2023, which will increase unemployment, it will take some of the sting out of wage rises independently of what's going on with inflation, then I do think that it is quite possible that inflation will return to 2% or at least around to close-ish to 2% over that horizon into 2024 or so. Linda, do you agree? Yeah, provided there isn't another price shock. So it is true, it's a year-on-year -year measure. So the reason we have this big jump is because Russia invaded Ukraine in February. Um, and... Uh, the OBR says that inflation will fall sharply from next summer, and that is a result of the recession, because unfortunately, recession makes everybody poor. We're going to spend less, demand less, and therefore that's going to exert downward pressure. Well, doesn't it inflation. depend what kind of inflation it is? Because if you think back to the recession in the early 80s, I mean, there, there was quite high inflation then. Mm. Yeah, in early 80s, um, uh, it was a result and of... indeed early 90s, I think. Yeah, so inflation stayed very high for about three years after um, the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War of 1978-1979. And um, uh, if you think about interest rates, it went to double digits at that period as well, and that eventually brought inflation down. There's probably a number of structural differences between then and now. But one difference that's added to inflation now is that the Middle East were not major commodity exporters other than energy. Russia, Ukraine are major hard and soft commodity exporters. That's metals as well mm. as food. That brings the worry that inflation will be more embedded and more persistent than uh, what some of these forecasts are suggesting. And just on the point about the autumn statement, because of this um, this cap on energy, um, on, on average household pays, um, that's the reason why inflation is now going to peak probably around now versus the 13 percent that the Bank of England had previously forecast. So it is possible for fiscal policy to try and um, try and lower that. But there is a cost to that, 100 billion or so of support given to households as to the debt. Um, but that is indeed trying to help bring down inflation. Um, Alfie, do you think that there's any possibility of inflation coming down that quickly? No, I think actually it does look like inflation's coming. You're uh, going to agree again. Uh, I agree, and and I think, <laughs> but I think I, with Thurman, some degree, I think, I think there's a really important point here, which is that um, there's a lot of evidence at the moment that suggests the Bank of England may have gone too far um, in terms of the rate rises um, that we've seen. The market, uh, the prevailing market conditions, um, suggest um, Bank of England in the Bank of England forecast suggest uh, inflation going below the target of two percent in a couple of years' time. The OBR, which saw today, I think inflation could go negative within the forecast period, you know, well below target. This is, these are not healthy conditions. This is because, as we heard, the depth of the recession, in part, contributed to by rising interest rates. So, you know, I think there's a case now to say, whoa, guys, have we gone too far? Have we gone too fast? Do we need to look to the recessionary impacts as well uh, and not just keep an eye on inflation that may well end up being transitory um, over the next 12 months. I mean, Ian, you were on the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee and I can remember various discussions with you where you were quite hawkish on interest rates, I seem to remember, and, and would vote continuously for them to go up. 
what, what, describe it as continuously, but on well, occasion. Okay, broadly. <laughs> uh, um, what, what, what's your view on what Alfie just said? Um, I wouldn't say that I think the bank has gone yet too far, and I also believe that market expectations are probably still at the high end of where the bank will eventually end up. So I do think that there are probably um, a small amount of monetary tightening still to go um, over the course of the coming months. Okay. But the markets are now expecting rates to peak out at about 4.5%. That's down from the 6.5% immediately after the quarting. Well, there'll be a lot of people listening so, to this who will be cheering with it, that you're so, all saying this. So, yeah. we're all, so we're already seeing mortgage rates are actually now being brought down again by some of the commercial banks. Even the 4.5%, I suspect, will prove to be probably slightly higher than the bank will need to go in order to bring okay. inflation back. Yeah, are you well, going to break the consensus? We're, we're expecting at the moment for interest rates to peak at 4 um, so it is still a little bit lower than um, the market. And, and ultimately, what we need to bear in mind in terms of the inflation forecast that we've seen from the OBR and both also the Bank of England is that they are based on market interest rates, which are higher than that, which means that inflation is unlikely to go down as far as what um, those forecasts are telling us. And also, I suspect inflation is going to be a little bit stickier. So if you look at the way inflation has spread, beyond the core um, the core categories beyond the, the stuff we import beyond the metals etc um, given essentially the fact that we have still a very tight economy yeah so we are going to see an ease in that we're going to see a weaker economy but still it is not going to be that that much uh, looser. We're not expecting an employment rate to go up by that much, which means that we could see inflation slightly higher, but still meeting the Bank of England target of 2% probably by 2024. Well, I regard that as all very optimistic, so um, we should end the programme there, I think, but we won't because we've got half an hour to go to take more questions. 0345 6060 It's 8.32. News headlines on LBC with Tim Daly. A rise in their taxes and energy bills will see more than half of households worse off as a result of the autumn statement. The Office for Budget Responsibility is predicting people's disposable income is going to fall by 7%. More people will pay the highest tax rate while income tax thresholds will be frozen until 2028 as inflation rises. Households will get less support with their energy bills with a typical family spending £3,000 a year from April. And the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, will be joining Nick Ferrari on breakfast tomorrow morning on LBC to talk about all of that. And also Royal Mail workers have announced a series of fresh strikes next month, including one on Christmas Eve. Members of the Communication Workers Union are now involved in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. In the markets in the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down four points at 73.46. The pound buys $1.18 and €1.14. LBC weather, wet and windy for much of the country tonight, but drier with just a few showers in the far south and a low of 5 degrees. The Autumn Statement. Have your say on LBC.
Britain's Conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Let me reintroduce my panel. We have Professor Ian McCafferty, former member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee and now Senior Advisor for the financial advisory company London Wall Partners. Uh, Yale Selfin is Chief Economist for the accountancy company KPMG. Dr Linda Yu is an economist based at the University of Oxford and the author of the book The Great Economist. And Alfie Sterling is Director of Research and Chief Economist for the New Economics Foundation. Right, let's go to a text question from Martin in Coombe in Gloucestershire. What help is there for people with savings uh, which are losing their value by 11% this year? Savings were not mentioned at all by the Chancellor today. Have we been forgotten again? Yale. Well, um, I'd like to say that um, savings are important in the sense that they're the flip side of investment. So there's a lot of capital that we would want um, to deploy in um, investing in, in better technologies and um, in improving our productivity, um, we have got higher rates and we have got rates that are likely to stay higher for longer. So overall, investors are at a better position now than uh, previously, especially bearing in mind that the episode of inflation that we're seeing at the moment is short term and we are expecting interest rates to remain higher for much longer. So in the longer term, these are better times for savers than we've seen for, for over a decade now. Alfie? Yeah, I mean, I think overall the people that are losing over the next couple of years are those that are going into a recession, going to see their real earnings uh, suppressed, uh, going to see a heightened risk of redundancy, unemployment, are getting very little in support from this government, negligible over the next two years was the fiscal uh, position from this government. Um, they're the real losers, not people actually that have taken income from their assets, their investments, capital gains, dividends. Um, so overall, the big picture is actually, if you're relying on earnings for a living, you're far less shielded from what we're about to face. Right, let's go to a caller. Johnny's in Kilburn. Hello, Johnny. Hi, Ian. Good evening. Hi. I'd like to ask the panel their views on the extent to which Brexit is to blame for the current economic situation. Well, of course, Rishi Sunak was asked this question earlier this week and denied Brexit was the cause, blaming the effects of coronavirus and the war in Ukraine instead. Um, I, I think this is one that a lot of people struggle with. And if you're, if you're allocating blame for the current economic difficulties, how much do you put it down to the war in Ukraine? How much do you put it down to the pandemic? How much do you put it down to Brexit? How much do you put it down to general economic mismanagement over the last 12 years? Linda? Well, I would say exactly 8%. No. <laughs> 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 um, I think this is one of the challenges with um, macroeconomics because all the factors, um, essentially, they, they feed each other. So the estimates around Brexit is that it will make our economy 4% smaller. That's the OBR uh, forecast. Um, is, does that mean it will grow by 4% less than it would have done or actually a contraction smaller. of 4%? Yeah, so it'll be 4% smaller. So um, And the hit is to productivity. And as Ian said, um, you know, after that period, um, after the adjustment period, which is always a transition cost, um, the forecasting doesn't go that far. So the longer term impact is still yet to be seen. So I think on the output side, the main reason why we are, um, you know, so slow growing are around investment, the things that, um, you know, we've discussed. There's been quite a lot of research around this, and they do essentially point to the fact that um, investment is lower here than it is in uh, other G7 countries. And the root causes it has of that. been over decades, hasn't it? Exactly. So the current, exactly. So the current um, reason why we are still a smaller economy than uh, we were pre-pandemic, when the G7 are already larger, is because of the inflation. How much inflation we import, and that does have to do with uh, the lockdowns of the pandemic, uh, because we import such a great deal. The lockdown causes supply chain dislocations that added to our prices, and then even though we are not as reliant on the continent on Russian energy, we are again a big, we're affected by global prices and we import, pass through more of that into our economy. So the inflation side, it's definitely global factors. On the growth side, some very long-term factors um, that have been with us for a few years and indeed for a few decades. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a very good analysis. I, mean, I, I always see 
Brexit, if you like, as a long-term sea anchor on the economy. It slowed the economy's growth, and the, particularly the problems we face with investment have been more marked since the referendum in 2016 in terms of relative performance compared with other countries than they were even before that. We've always been a low investment economy, but it's got worse since Brexit, simply because of the uncertainty about the trading conditions and the regulatory environment that businesses now face. Uh, that may disappear over time as people get used to the uh, the new the new arrangements, but so far it's acted as a drag on growth at a, a very sensitive time. But in terms of the proximate causes for the current, it's very much what's gone on in Ukraine and the eightfold increase in gas prices since uh, since mm. 2020, the rises in soft commodity prices because Ukraine is a big grain exporter, as well as some of the other uh, products that have been affected uh, by the disruption to trade that we've seen. The pandemic has also had an effect in two ways. One, because we had significant uh, disruption to supply chains and that caused a burst of inflation as we started to open up. And more recently, we have seen some significant changes to the way labour markets in different economies, and in particular in the UK, seem to be working. And that's meant that we've seen a, 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 a reduction in supply of labour at a time when the economies were recovering. And that has meant that we've hit full employment and therefore seen inflation pressures in the and UK. And that is an easy one to blame entirely two. on Brexit. But, but then, of course, other well, European I, I don't countries know that have it got is this just as well. entirely because of Brexit. No, I don't the, either. The, but a lot of people are blaming it. Well, I think there is a Brexit effect, clearly labour supply from within Western Europe or from within the EEC has fallen quite significantly uh, since we, since we, or since the referendum and certainly since the, the uh, exit deal was agreed. But at the moment, the main problem for the UK does seem to be the sharp rise in those unable to mm. work because of long-term sickness, which is more to do with the pandemic. Yeah. So I think... We're right to say there is no single factor that you can blame. It's a whole series of complex interactions that has led us to where we are now. And each of them has a percentage uh, to, you know, blame to, to be attributed. Alfie? Yeah, I mean, I think the question... I, that's all right, I agree with all of that. But I think the question you can simplify it a little bit and also perhaps make it a bit more interesting by saying, you know, not just let's understand what's caused the UK outlook, but what explains the difference between the UK and other countries? Like, you know, we mentioned the G7 um, have all recovered uh, pre-pandemic levels, whereas the UK hadn't. And I think you can put it into two uh, uh, buckets, if you like. One is um, structural fundamental weakness in the UK relative to other advanced economies. Part of that is Brexit. Um, and although it's a long-run level effect for the most part, some of that pain got brought forward by collapse in the currency, you know, shortly after 2016 as well. So that pain was brought forward um, as well. Part of it's Brexit. The other part, I think, is, you know, a decade of austerity undermining fundamentals in the economy. It's demand growth is then how that fed through into productivity, uh, real earnings, infrastructure. So weak fundamentals, bucket number one. Bucket number two, how have we handled the post-pandemic environment um, and the price shock um, and again I think that you have to look at monetary policy we went we moved earlier and went faster on um, monetary policy interest rate increase than other countries um, and we are already very prematurely turning to try and balance the books if you like reduce our debt and borrowing despite the fact the UK path for debt and borrowing is far lower than most of the G7. And if you look at the Eurozone, they've suspended their fiscal rules precisely to make sure that they get the right support for the economy right now. So those are the differences, I think, between UK and other countries, and they explain a large part um, of why our malaise is heightened compared to other countries. Yeah. I just wanted to add one more thing, um, and that is related to what we've talked about just now, but also previously, whereby the fact that we potentially have less export, less successful exports and less foreign direct investment to the UK and less foreign workers coming to the UK, especially from EU countries, is that it is also impacting longer term productivity. So it's all the, all the implications that Linda has already said about the actual levels of exports and investments that we're getting less of. But then we're also getting this multiplier effect of lower productivity because we're not getting that synergy, this access to know-how from, from other companies, bigger competition, um, that makes our longer-term growth weaker as a result of being a potentially closer economy. OK, we'll come to more of your questions in just a couple of moments' time. It's 8.47. The Autumn Statement. Have your say on LBC.
www.cnbc.com. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Uh, we have with us Ian McCartney, Yale Sulfin, uh, Linda Yu, and Alfie Sterling. Let's go to a text question from Colin in Carrick Fergus, who says the Chancellor has promised both growth and more investment for each of the devolved nations. But with Northern Ireland facing a higher cost of living and the ongoing issues surrounding the protocol, around the protocol, can the Chancellor really promise growth will be shared equally across the United Kingdom? Who would like to take that one? I don't think any Chancellor can promise growth that will be shared absolutely equally across different parts of the United Kingdom ever. So I don't, I don't think it necessarily is, is an achievable objective. One of the reasons that we have the levelling up programme is that we do see significant differences in growth rates and, uh, and standards of living across different parts of the country. So I think he can offer some help to Northern Ireland in order to uh, alleviate some of their problems, but I don't think he can promise that everywhere is going to benefit equally. Anyone else? I think we're being too generous in accepting the frame of what the Chancellor said. We've been talking for, you know, 50 minutes about how the UK's outlook is incredibly grim. So talking about how we share up the cake and the growth is quite far removed from the reality, which is actually where's the pain... Get more cake. Where's Boris the, would where's the pain going to fall? <laughs> um, um, and certainly, I think, different parts of the country will, will be in a worse situation than others. Uh, Stephen on the Isle of Dogs says, given that there are many highly trained young people in China who are currently unemployed, would this be a good time to offer work permits so they can come and work in the UK? And I'm told the most recent youth unemployment figure for China is 17.9%. Um, yeah. Well, we we certainly uh, can benefit from for more work as at the moment as it's a very tight labour market. As I say, obviously, there's certain still people on the sidelines that we want to bring into the labour market and we want to upskill the people that we have in the labour market that potentially could benefit from um, better skills and, if you like, um, better jobs. But at the same time, yes, there is definitely a shortage, especially in technology area, of of people and, and that will help us not only in terms of overall growth but it would also help us and and firms more generally to implement new technologies in in their companies and therefore generate higher growth in in their businesses linda uh, yeah i think the focus on um trying to attract um you know, in parts of the labour market where indeed, as Yale says, it is very tight and we de do need more workers and be able to attract the best and the brightest from around the world um, is actually one of the um, one of the ways to be an open society, an open economy. Um, and I think the important um, change in immigration um, that we have seen is that we have now have a uh, more like a points-based system where you are actually looking for more highly skilled workers um, to, to come in, I think. So, yes, I think unemployment is actually very high for youth, um, not just in China, but actually in a number of countries. Um, and if there were vacancies here we can't fill locally, then I think, you know, it kind of reinforces the UK as an open um, economy um, where the best one to come. Will you but, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, everybody, but we used to have quite a high rate of youth unemployment, but we haven't at the moment. Um, I don't know why, if there's sort of structural differences in our economy compared to France, Germany, Italy, but youth unemployment here has been consistently lower for quite a long time. Do you expect that to change, Ian? Uh, well, it is always the case that uh, when recession strikes, it is usually the, the younger workers who suffer more than average. Uh, it's also the case that it's usually the less skilled workers, not that mm. the two necessarily overlap as groups. So I think from that point of view, we probably will see youth unemployment start to rise as employment overall starts to rise. The, the OBR forecasts suggest, as Yale mentioned earlier, Earlier, that we don't expect unemployment to soar during this recession. It's going up from about 3.7% now to the forecast of about 4.9% in two and two and two and two two and a half years' time or so. And that's still, by the history of the UK, a very low rate of unemployment, particularly after a five or six quarter recession. But I do think, yes, there are some parts of the community that will suffer more than average. Right, let's go to a text from Roy in Leeds. Is expecting economies to grow perpetually actually sustainable well if we had a green party representative here i suspect they would say absolutely not are we going to get consensus on the panel on this let's start with you alfie well you can't ask the question in the abstract it's growth of what like, you know what are we talking about growth of what um i think in the end um if you only talk about growing output 
and you disregard everything else, that's quite likely that might end up being unsustainable. If in the end you actually target the things that policy wants, so, you know, perhaps rising living standards, uh, reduce material throughput, reduce carbon emissions, um, you can probably do all those things. And a byproduct of that may be growth. Um, so it could be, will be possible. But you have to target the things that you actually want to see improving and talk about growth of those things, living standards, productivity, uh, reduced material throughput. Um, uh, otherwise, it becomes a slightly confused debate, I think, and you may well end up with unsustainable growth. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Hell, I nearly called you Linda. That's fine. <laughs> I can be Linda for a day. Um, so, so essentially, if you look at the size of the economy, to start with, you, the, the economy can grow because we have more people, more people working, and, and that would mean um, that, that it will be a larger economy. But the economy also grows when we invest more and we have more machines, if you like, um, that produce, and also when we're more productive. And we've had a number of industrial revolution and you could say we're in the, the midst of another industrial revolution where we're hoping to see that fruit with higher productivity that would make us each produce more for per, per each effort that we make or per each day that we, we work and, and that's a wonderful thing and that's what makes us wealthier over time. So I think there's still more to go and it's all down to how we embed new technologies and and have new invest in in inventions and invest in in innovation. Linda, um, I think that if we uh, the economy didn't grow, then I think your income you would expect your income not to be growing, and therefore your standard of living wouldn't be growing, and then therefore amount of taxes you're paying wouldn't be able to support things like the NHS and um, education services. So I think. Um, Alfie's point around what how you grow I think is very important so to grow sustainably means that you ought to be growing um, in ways that preserves the planet that is more equal for society so I think thinking qualitatively about what growth means really matters but you know but we must always bear in mind the level of services that we enjoy is a function of um, the standard of living of this country and so a lot of the challenges that we have around the NHS for instance um, we do need to invest in that and we need to pay for that and I think that's one of the reasons to keep thinking about how we want to grow as an economy. Okay. Yeah. Well at a global level we are going to need to keep growing for quite some time yet. The UN population uh, projections suggest that we passed six million six billion people in the world uh, not long ago last eight week. Billion. Eight billion I beg your pardon last week and we're not expected to peak as a global population for another 40-45 years at which point we'll uh, we'll peak at about 10 billion people and after that it's expected to decline. If those that increase from 8 billion to 10 billion is not to see a significant decline in their living standards, we are going to have to see some form of economic growth over that next 40 years. But I agree that essentially we, we do have to consider not only growth for its own sake but how that is delivered and what it delivers in order to make it sustainable. Now, um, we could finish up with a, an ec economic question, but I'm going to take you out of your economic comfort zone now. Um, a final text question from Sarah in Portsmouth. America's trademarks office has told Mariah Carey that she's not allowed to trademark the phrase the Queen of Christmas for herself. You can each declare yourself the Queen or King of something, though. What will it be? Alfie. Oh, I can't. I, um, as a as a you know stalwart Republican, I'd have to choose a different I mean, president. Of, uh, <laughs> president of <laughs> um, <laughs> economics. Of, of keen economic insight. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, uh, I'd say Queen of Monopoly because Christmas is approaching, and that's what we'll be playing. Is it? I love a good game of Monopoly, but only if I win. <laughs> Linda, <laughs> what are you Queen of? <laughs> Um, if I could be queen of my own pack of dogs, I would think that was a huge accomplishment by Christmas. That's a different one. I'd love to go into that more deeply. Ian? It's difficult because I have a good number of hobbies and I'm actually halfway decent at all of them, so I'm not sure I'm king of anything. But if I was going to be king of something I really enjoy, it would be king of chocolate. 
I'm totally with you on that. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for joining us on this special Autumn Statement edition of Cross Question. We're going to come back to your calls now, getting your reaction to Jeremy Hunt's Autumn Statement this, this afternoon. Uh, particularly, I want to hear your views on this thing that's emerged this afternoon. He didn't mention it, but it is in the the, the, the red book. Do they have a red book for Autumn Statements? I'm not sure, but it's in the, in the minutiae. 23% fuel duty hike starts in March 2023. Um, 12p on a litre of petrol or diesel. How's that going to affect you? It's certainly going to affect inflation, I would have thought. 0345 6060 973. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, millions of people are likely to face what's been called a staggering fall in disposable incomes as a result of energy bills and tax rises. The news is coming from the Office for Budget Responsibility after the Chancellor unveiled his autumn statement, during which he announced the energy price cap will rise by £500 in April, meaning higher gas and electricity bills in the spring. The country's top earners will also start paying 45% tax on what they make above £120. £25,000 instead of £150,000. John Glenn is the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. He's been telling LBC that big spending cuts are on the back burner for now. We're keeping the envelopes that we agreed at the spending review last year and then we've made some uh, additional choices around more money for the NHS, for social care and also for schools. The windfall tax on energy companies will be increased to 35%, but there will be less support for household bills, although more money is being set aside for schools, the NHS and social care. Wes Streeting is the Shadow Health and Social Care Secretary for Labour. He's been telling LBC there are certain things the government should have done. We finally beat the Conservatives into submission on the windfall tax, but they are still giving money away to big energy producers in the form of subsidies for production of oil and gas. We would abolish the non-DOM status because we think if you live in this country you should pay your taxes here. There are lots of other examples I could give of tax loopholes for private equity fund managers, abolishing the charitable mm. states on private schools to raise money. But the missing piece of the jigsaw as far as I was concerned is a serious plan for growth. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, will be joining Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC tomorrow. Elsewhere, the Royal College of Nursing says it's giving the government five days to arrange what it's describing as meaningful talks on pay, or it will announce strikes for December. Members of the union voted in favour of industrial action last week. At the same time, the Royal Mail has announced a series of fresh strikes next month, including one on Christmas Eve. Members of the Communication Workers' Union are involved in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. And three soldiers from a pro-Russian separatist army have been convicted of murder over the deaths of 298 people on board flight MH17. The Boeing 777 was shot down over Ukraine in 2014. They're believed to be in Russia and unlikely to be extradited. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down four points at 73.46. The pound gets $1.18 and also €1.14. LBC weather, wet and windy for much of the country tonight, but drier with just a few showers in the far south and a low of 5 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Day. 